structure I have. Stuff where I can reach it and it won't get. Just tell me when to go. Okay. Good morning. My name's Beth. I'm the chart, the nurse at Southern Hills Hospital who teaches the joint replacement class. I'm also a nurse on the unit, and I'm a charge nurse. So you may or may not see me um, doing different jobs at Southern Hills Hospital when you come in for your surgery. We have this class to help reduce anxiety help reduce your risk for blood clots, help reduce your risk for falls, and help reduce your risk for infection. We try and keep our information channels running smoothly back and forth between patient and caregivers, and we try and make it easier for patients and families to ask questions. You have a lot of people taking care of you at Southern Hills Hospital. You have doctors, you have nurses, you also have physical therapists, lab technicians, respiratory technicians, CNAs or certified nurses assistants. You have a surgical team that takes care of you. We are color coded at Southern Hills Hospital. The nurses wear this color blue. It's kind of a royal blue. The CNAs or patient care technicians wear a dark teal color. The surgical staff all wears dark blue. So you can't tell a doctor or a nurse or a technician from each other based on the color of their uniform. They have to wear a badge. Everybody wears a badge. It says on our badge what our job is. If they don't have a badge when they come into your room to take care of you, send them out. Everybody needs to be identified as an employee of Southern Hills Hospital or contracted with Southern Hills Hospital. Things that you need to discuss with your surgeon before you have surgery are the risks and benefits. The risks and benefits we talk about here are pain control, things that can happen like nausea and vomiting. We also try and help you reduce your risk for blood clots, for falls, and reduce your risk for infection. Those are things we talk about in the class. If you have any questions while we're talking, feel free to chime in on, the on, a, on a keyboard and I'll try and answer your questions. When you come into the hospital for your pre-admit process, pre-admit is starting today with you watching a video, getting some education. Pre-admit is the administration part. That's where they need your information, your insurance information, your ID. So when you come in, you can come in up to three days before you have your surgery. They need a photo ID, your insurance card, and a form of copayment if you have it. That's between your insurance company, you and the hospital. I have nothing to do with that. You want to make sure any labs, EKGs, or x-rays that are ordered by your surgeon are done. If you don't have them done when you come in to do your surgery, you could be delayed with your surgical start. You can also register online at southernhillshospital.com, and it will uh, bring up your uh, information. It's basic information, your name, address, and um, insurance information. A couple days from, a couple days before surgery, you get a call from a nurse. They will tell you information that you need to know about the, your surgery, the time you're going to come in, medications that you're taking, and they'll quiz you a little bit about information um, concerning your medication. If you do come in three days before surgery, you can get a bottle of medicated body wash, and I'll talk about that medicated body wash in a minute. The nurses are going to ask you about your medications. The doctors are going to ask you about your medications. We do that because we need to know that we have the exact medications in the exact times. There's multiple medications that are in our computer system, and we want to make sure we're choosing the right one for your particular um, need. We also need to know about over-the-counter items you're taking, any herbal remedies, vitamins, minerals, homeopathic remedies. They can interact with anesthesia, pain medicine, and your clotting mechanisms. So we need to know what they are 
so we can make sure that we either continue with them or not continue them in the proper time frame. Three days before you have your surgery, or three bathings before you have your surgery, you're going to shower with an antibacterial body wash. If you get the one from the hospital, that's enough for two washings, so you need to get another one. You can use a bar soap or you can use a liquid soap, anything that says antibacterial on it. So if your surgery is on Tuesday and you decide to take a shower Tuesday morning, you're going to use the hospital-provided antibacterial soap, then Monday and Sunday. That way you have as much bacteria removed from your body as possible. We have bacteria on our bodies at all time, and we cannot remove 100% of it. We try and reduce the bacterial load by doing the body wash three days before. Pay special attention to the surgical site. If it's your shoulder, wash it really well. Don't use a loaf of sponge or a scrub brush that puts tiny micro tears in your skin, and that's a spot for bacteria to get in. We want your skin to be intact as possible. Wash your hair really well. Don't use the antibacterial body wash on your hair. You'll come in with a big fuzzy head because it will dry your hair out. You won't be able to get into the shower for about two days, so make sure your hair is nice and clean and remove any dark fingernail polish. We can have a light color, but we use a machine called the pulse oximeter and that measures the oxygen in your blood. Dark fingernail polish sometimes interrupts that. The evening before surgery, you're going to stop eating and drinking at midnight. That means no smoking, no gum, no mint, no nothing, no ice chips. You can brush your teeth, rinse and spit, and that's it. We don't want anything in your stomach to cause um, problems during surgery. Things you want to bring with you to the hospital, clothes that are easy to get on and off. You are going to get some fancy socks. They're yellow socks. They indicate that you're a, a fall risk, and they have grippers on them. We ask that you wear these when you're out of bed, especially because they, they help re reduce your risk for falls. We also will give you an armband and we will put um, a triangle on your door that indicates you're a fall risk. It helps the staff know to keep an extra eye out to make sure that you stay safe. Bring, you don't need to bring any canes or walkers with you. The day you're discharged, we may ask that you bring a walker that you have at home to make sure it's fitted and it's the proper kind for you. Bring hearing aids, glasses, and dentures with you. You need to be able to see, hear, and talk while you're in the hospital. Right before surgery, they take all of those items and they put them in containers and they either hand them off to a loved one or they put them in a bag on your chart. You do not need to bring any medications with you to the hospital. We have everything you need. If there is a specific medication, we'll let your loved ones know which one we need you to have bring into the hospital so we can make sure you have all your medicines. Make sure, again, that you have a detailed list of your medications, what time you take them, the dosages of them. That way we can continue your program, your medical program that you use at home. Any herbal medications and vitamins you need to know as well. The herbal medications, uh, something like um, St. John's Wort is something that a lot of people use for depression and mood elevation. It works really well for those things, but it also interacts with anesthesia. So that's why your doctors need to know all of those medicines. We discourage you bringing valuables to the hospital. They can get lost, they can get stolen. We have never had an issue on our unit, but it can happen. You can bring a laptop or a phone, just realize that you are responsible for all your personal property. There is free internet um, or Wi-Fi available, so you can use those items if you want to. Only bring what you need for registration when it comes to photo IDs and your insurance card. You can also have your family members take those home after you've completed your registration. We are a tobacco-free campus, so no tobacco at all. No e-cigarettes, no chewing tobacco, no cigarettes, no cigars. If you are a smoker, let your doctor know so we can get a nicotine patch. It helps you through the worst of the cravings, and then when you go home, hopefully you continue not smoking. You will heal much better if you're not, not smoking. The morning of surgery, you need to arrive at your assigned time. The doctors do surgeries back to back, and there's multiple doctors. So if one person is behind, it makes the whole day go further and further behind. The pre-op nurse will tell you the night before your surgery, what time to be here. You're going to park in the parking lot and usually walk across. You can also uh, drop 
a patient off in this circular area and they can go in and start the registration process. The transporter can go and park and then meet up with the patient later. You're not going to take any diabetic medications the morning of surgery. There's new studies that indicate um, heart medications should be taken the morning of surgery. The nurse is going to tell you exactly which ones. No makeup, no contact lenses. They get in the way of surgery, and after surgery, you can put them back on. When you get here, don't park in the emergency room parking lot. We need that reserved for emergent cases only. We do have handicap available, so you can um, have somebody um, park in handicap if your transporter needs a, a shorter distance to walk. When you come into the hospital right now, we're only allowed to come in through the emergency room entrance. We're trying to um, streamline our um, screening process for COVID people. So you're going to get your temperature taken. You'll get a mask put on if you don't have one. Bring a mask with you if you do. And then you're going to go into the hospital and go to the right. It's really the only way to go. And then you're going to go to the registration process. That's where they start a kind of Tarkin medical to you. They will get you registered. They'll put an armband on you. Make sure the armband's correct. It's very tiny, and if you wear cheaters like I do, you can't see it. You want to make sure your name's correct, because if they mistype your name, your insurance company is going to send you a bill because the hospital did surgery on the wrong person according to your registration information. They'll take you to the pre-procedure care unit. We call it the PPCU. And this is where you need to stop a lot of employees and say, I don't know what you just said. Because somebody will say, I'm a CNA, I'm going to take you to the PPCU, we're going to start an IV and put SCDs on you. I know what that means, you may not. So ask them what it means. PPCU stands for pre-procedure care unit. IV stands for intravenous line. We use that to give you medications. SCDs are these. They go on your lower leg and they connect to a machine and they pump up with air. It helps prevent blood clots. So we ask that you wear these as much as possible while you're in the hospital. But they also put you at a fall risk because they're connected to the end of the bed by this little pump piece. So when you need to get up, ask for help. There's call lights everywhere. If you can't find your call light button or the button on the bed, yell somebody will hear you we don't want you to get up and fall and injure yourself especially injure that new piece of equipment we just put in your body so in the pre-procedure care area they put a hospital gown on you they start an iv your surgery site is confirmed the doctor is going to come in and write on the area that they're doing surgery your family can stay with you while you're there one family member or one visitor can stay with you until it's time to go uh, back to surgery then you can um, go into the waiting room. Once surgery is over, they'll come out and let you know how surgery went. Currently, we are only allowed one, one visitor in the surgical area until surgery is done. Once the patients are coming up to the orthopedic unit, no more visitors allowed. So make sure that you understand that. It's not the funnest time right now, but that's how we have to do it to keep all of the patients and all of the staff members safe. During surgery, you have seven to 10 people taking care of you the whole time you're in surgery. You have an anesthesiologist, you have a rotating nurse, you have a surgical nurse, you have your doctor, physician's assistant, and a technician. And then sometimes there's two or three more people in the room taking care of you. They're all very good at what they do. I've worked here for um, almost 11 years now, and I've worked with most of those people the whole time. It says a lot about the facility we work for says it's a good place to work and we work well together. Anesthesiologists will sometimes meet with you before surgery and talk to you about previous experiences and problems that you've had after surgery. A lot have changed in the past few years about with medications, so there's a big reduction in um, problems after surgery, especially with nausea, and they'll talk to you about that. After surgery, you're going to go to the PACU, which is the post-anesthesia care unit, or the recovery room. There the nurse has one or two patients. You get a lot of personal care. Again, those nurses have been there for quite a few years. I've worked with most of them the whole time I've been here. They've even taken care of me after I had surgery. They manage your pain. They make sure that your vital signs are stable and that things are going well. Once you're stable, they call the fifth floor, which is the orthopedic unit, 
and let us know this patient is ready to come up to the floor. When you come up to the unit, you're going to have pain. You're still going to be pretty groggy, so you may not even remember the trip up here. That's pretty normal. You can see there's a couple pictures behind me of our unit. There's a picture of the bed, one of the rooms. We have five different rooms, and they are all private rooms. They all have bathrooms, and all the bathroom rooms' doors locked. It makes it much easier to get to a normal bathroom routine when you don't have to worry about people coming in and out because us nurses are notorious for we knock on the door and we walk right in. We don't even wait for an answer. So it's kind of how life is in the hospital. We try and be as respectful as possible, but we have a lot to do and you have a lot to do. We just You're not going to have any visitors right now um, until that changes. We're just going to leave it at that. We do have a physical therapy gym on our unit. We have four different halls. We refer to them as pods, A, B, C, and D. We also have stairs on our, hosp our, on our unit. If you have a set of stairs at home, they'll take you on those stairs. If you need to just do two or three stairs, they have those in the gym, so you can go on those. Some things you're gonna see while you're in the hospital, there's a couple different kinds of drains. One of them is a striker drain. It, will, uh, it drains excess fluid out of your body after surgery. There's a picture of it up on the board. They also have something called a JP drain that looks like a big goose egg. And we squeeze it down and compress it, and then we seal it. And as it re-expands, it makes a gentle suction and pulls out excess fluid. It helps reduce swelling and inflammation in that, um, the surgical area, which helps reduce pain. We also have something called a hemovac, which looks like an accordion. It kind of squeezes up and down, and it same issue, same theory is you squeeze it down, seal it, and as it re-expands, it helps reduce um, inflammation in that joint. We also have something called SCDs, which I already showed you a picture of. That's what this is right here. This helps reduce blood clots. It squeezes your legs and helps keep the blood moving. If you're having a knee replacement, we're going to use this one. This is a foot pump, and it looks like a, a little sock, and it helps squeeze your leg. The SCDs, the longer ones, these ones, come too close to the incision on your knee for us to use. And we do not use the thigh SCDs on our facility. We also use something called TED hose. They're white, stretchy stockings that help reduce blood clots by keeping the veins compressed. They have an opening on the toe, so you can wiggle. Make sure you do not try and get up and walk with these. They're very slippery. You want to wear your yellow socks that we're giving you. These also have a tendency to roll up. So if they do roll, pull them up. Keep them smooth. When they roll, they have a, make a rubber band effect. And that cuts off the blood supply and reduces their effectiveness. We also use chemicals. Most of the time, it's aspirin, Xarelto. We use Lovenox, and sometimes we use Coumadin or heparin. It depends on your body, your history, and what surgery you had. The doctor will decide what they're going to use for you. While you're in the hospital, you're going to have your orthopedic surgeon, and you're also going to have a um, hospitalist who's going to take care of your medical needs while you're in the hospital. Getting up and moving also reduces your risk for blood clots. Blood clots form because you're sitting and the blood kind of pools in one spot. Moving your legs helps that mo blood move up. You can also do foot pumps. It's just as simple as moving your foot up and down. That helps keep the blood moving. Every 10 minutes, do five of them on each foot. You're gonna help prevent blood clots. So you're gonna have pain. You have pain now. We're taking out the bad spot and putting in something new. And then you also have surgical pain. So when you tell us you have pain, we believe you. Be honest with us, be open. We know it's different for everybody. And we believe you when you say, I'm a 10 out of 10. That's OK. We use a scale from 0 to 10. 10 is the worst pain. 0 is none. It's unrealistic to think that you're going to have absolutely no pain. We try and keep you in what I call, keep you with your circle type, which is right in here, between a 4 and a 6. If you take a pill or get some IV medication, when your pain is at a 6, it goes down to a four or below rather quickly. If you wait until your pain is way at the top, 
Like an eight, it takes even longer for it to get down and you're uncomfortable. Your blood pressure's up, your heart rate's up, you don't feel good, you don't rest. So don't be afraid to take something. There's a lot of things that we can do to help reduce pain besides giving you medication. We can move you. A lot of times you're not having extreme pain in your new knee that you just had placed. Your behind hurts because you've been sitting for eight hours or laying for eight hours in a rather uncomfortable position in a not so comfortable bed. Our hospital beds are not the most comfortable things in the world. So we can sometimes move you up in bed. We can get you up and get you in a chair because we do get you up the day of surgery. We can put a pillow underneath you. We can also use ice and ice works really, really good. It has no side effects. It's just cold. It helps reduce inflammation. Reducing the inflammation reduces the pressure, reduces your pain. So we're gonna use all of those things to keep you comfortable while you're in the hospital. Another thing you're gonna to need to use is called an incentive spirometer. It helps reduce pneumonia, which is an infection. You're gonna inhale on this piece of equipment three times every 10 minutes while you're awake. It's a nice, slow, easy inhale. Hold it for a second and let it out. You don't have to get it all the way to the top. Everybody is different. We want it, it's more method. Slow and easy, hold it, and you'll re-expand your lungs. A lot of times you'll cough after you use it. That's normal. It's just getting the gunk from anesthesia out of your body. We have falls. We don't want people to fall in the hospital. You're at a risk for fall because you're out of your own environment. We're giving you medication that makes you dizzy and change your thought process, and you have a new piece of equipment in your body that you're trying to figure out how to use. Call for help. That's the best way to prevent falls. So we talked a little bit about preventing infections with using the incentive spirometer that prevents infections in our lung. The best way to prevent infection is washing or sanitizing your hands. In our hospital, up and down the halls and in every room, there's a sanitizing station. Thank you. They are to help prevent, sorry, I need a drink of water. Infections. The way we do it is it takes 30 seconds to wash your hands. It takes 30 seconds to sanitize your hands. When a nurse or a CNA or a doctor or a physical therapist is walking in your room and they're rubbing their hands together, they're sanitizing their hands because they've gotten foam. If you don't see them do it or you have a question about them doing it, ask them. Ask them to go back to the sink and wash their hands. There's nothing wrong with that. You need to speak up for yourself and keep yourself protected. And washing and sanitizing of our hands is the best way to keep you from getting bacteria from us. And you washing and sanitizing your hands is the best way to keep you safe when you're eating after you use the bathroom, when you brush your teeth after you've walked in the halls. Anytime you touch something, you need to wash your hands. So things that happen after surgery. Nausea and vomiting, constipation, anemia, lightheaded and dizziness, swelling in the affected arm or leg that you had surgery on. We have medications to help with nausea and vomiting. It happens because you have a change in eating habits and because we've given you medications that your body is not used to. Let us know what you need. Some people just need a flat Coke. That's what their mom used to give them and it works really well. We can give you medication, we can give you a soda cracker, we can give you a popsicle. There's a lot of things we can use. Constipation happens because you're not eating and drinking as you normally do. We're giving you pain medicine that slows your intestines down. You're not moving around, that slows your intestines down. Get back to your normal eating habits as soon as possible. Lots of water. You need to drink six to eight bottles of water a day. We provide you with a jug. And this jug, you should be drinking two to three of these a day of water. Make sure that you consume the right amount of water. Lots of fruits and vegetables. We also give you medication that helps with constipation. Most of the doctors prescribe it on a routine basis. Anemia happens because of blood loss. Most people do not have an issue. Every once in a while, we have to give somebody a blood transfusion, but it does not happen very often. Many of the surgeons start you on an iron supplement after surgery. Just while you're in the hospital, it helps your body rebuild and prevent um, anemia. 
Lightheaded and dizziness happens because of the medications we're giving you because you're lying down, you're not eating and drinking like you normally do. Get up slowly. If you're dizzy, sit down and wait until the dizziness pass. While you're walking in the halls, don't forget to breathe. Breathing is something we all kind of take for granted, but when you're walking in the halls with a new, say, knee, and the physical therapy is telling you all of these things to do, you're thinking about all of that, you forget to breathe. It will make you dizzy and you will pass out. So pay attention to your breathing too. And if you do get dizzy, tell somebody. They'll holler for a chair. A chair will appear out of nowhere because we pay attention to those things. We don't want anybody to fall. Same if in your room. If you're dizzy, sit down. If you have to sit on the floor, sit on the floor and yell. And then when they come in, you can tell them, I just sat down, I didn't fall. Because falling is more dangerous than sitting. You are going to have swelling in that affected extremity. So if you had a knee replacement on your right leg, your right leg is going to be swollen. That's normal. Sometimes it swells all the way down to your knee, I mean all the way down to your foot, and a little bit above the surgical area. That's normal. If it gets really big all of a sudden, that's when you need to call the doctor or your nurse if you're still in the hospital and let them know that something is going on because rapid swelling and pain is an indication that there's a problem. Goals after surgery. We want you to be able to go home safely. And physical therapy and occupational therapy are the people who work on that the most. They'll teach you precautions. If you had hip surgery or shoulder surgery, there's certain things you can't do. They give you exercises. They talk about pain control. Before they even get you up, they will come and talk to the nurse and ask when the last time you had pain medicine was. That way, we know that your pain's under control and you can have a good therapy session. If you're in pain, you're not gonna be able to work very well. When you get done, they put you back in bed or sit you up in a chair, get your ice on you, get your position comfortably, and they'll tell me if they're due for pain medicine, make sure you gave it to them because they worked really hard and they're uncomfortable. They'll get you on stairs. They teach you how to take care of yourself at home safely. One recommendation that they do make is if you had any kind of surgery that you purchase a shower chair. Most insurance companies don't cover that purchase and that's a good piece of equipment to have. A shower chair and a handheld shower will make your life a whole lot easier and more comfortable once you get home. We talked about stairs. They'll take you on stairs, teach you how to go up and down stairs with a walker if you have them, teach you how to get dressed, tips on taking a shower and getting dressed without putting yourself in a bad position or at risk for falls. Nutrition, we all know, is important no matter what time of our lives is. It's even more important when we have surgery. In order to heal properly, you have to have adequate, good protein. It does not have to be an animal protein if you're vegetarian. Just make sure you're getting enough protein. Our bodies need protein to heal. Iron and hydration. So water. Water, water, water. Soda is not adequate hydration. Tea is not adequate hydration. Coffee is not adequate hydration. If you drink a cup of coffee, you need to drink a cup of water. It's, I love coffee, but make sure you're drinking enough water. That's what our bodies need. So discharge planning. We have nurses who specialize in discharge planning. They will come and see you while you're in the hospital and they'll talk to you about where you live, who you live with, and what kind of needs you have. They talk with the doctor and the physical therapy to come up with a plan to get you home safely. And they work with your insurance company to get you the equipment you need. You can eat when you're hungry. Some people are hungry right after surgery. My husband had surgery. He wanted a hamburger and french fries right away. Me, I'm like, ah, not until tomorrow. If you, you can use a cell phone in the hospital. It does not interfere with any of the heart monitors like it used to in the olden days. Um, our visiting hours now at this time are limited. We are not allowing any visitors in. We're trying to uh, reduce the impact of uh, COVID-19 on the, the population. Your throat is sometimes sore because they put a tube down your throat when you have surgery to help you breathe. It irritates some people. Sometimes it's just dry and that irritates your throat. You can have hot tea, you can have a popsicle, you can get some ice cream, whatever's gonna work. If it continues to be an issue, we can get a throat lozenge or a spray for you. You can shower usually day one or two after surgery. Most surgeons now are using a water-resistant um, 
bandage after surgery. It stays on for a week and you can shower with it. It's water resistant, so you don't have to do anything to it. You can drive when you're cleared by your surgeon. You have to be able to operate your vehicle safely. If you had shoulder surgery, generally it's um, sometimes six weeks because you have to be, you're supposed to by law drive with two hands. Um, same with your feet. <laughs> Somebody is rolling their eyes in the background. <laughs> Um, operating the pedals of your car. You have to be able to go from the gas to the brake safely. So if you had surgery on your right leg, you're not going to be able to drive for a couple days. If you have a um, vehicle that's a stick shift and you need to use a clutch, you need both legs to be able to drive. So that needs to be, your doctor will tell you what you need to do. Generally in the hospital, anywhere from one day to three days, depending on your doctor and your surgery. The cafeteria is on the first floor for um, visitors, which we really don't need right now. Patients can go down there. So, but when you have a visitor, when you're having surgery, until you go back up to your room, they can go to the cafeteria. It's on the first floor. We also have a, co we also have a coffee shop in the, the main lobby, and they have really good coffee down there. I appreciate your time, and if you have any questions, please feel free to contact Southern Hills Hospital. Our orthopedic unit phone number is 702-916-6391. Thank you. Have a good day.